amino acids, proteins, and enzymes. So proteins, uh, they are composed of amino acids. Now, what are amino acids? So amino acids, you know, they have a central carbon, and uh, which is called the alpha carbon. And to that carbon, you have amino group and the carboxyl. So you have a carbon atom, and um, to that, uh, there's a carboxyl group. So very simple, think of it this way, that you have a carboxyl group, uh, you have an amino group, so there are four bonds around, around the carbon atom. And the R group, uh, this is the NH2, okay? So amino. So carboxyl group, amino group, and then you have R. R is any alkyl group, and the hydrogen. Okay, so this is the general setup of, uh, of any uh, amino acids and this uh, carbon is called the alpha carbon. Okay, and if you look at it, the four bonds, so this carbon is chiral carbon. Okay, that means it, uh, amino acids will be optically active uh, and they have this uh, optical isomers uh, just like the uh, carbohydrates, D and L. <clears throat> now, if R, so R equal to any alkyl group like CS3, C2H5, so methyl, ethyl, propyl, uh, or other, other with other uh, additional functional groups with R. Okay, so this is what varies. But rest of the amino acid, for all amino acids, this part is constant. Okay. And, and and this R R group is varying, and depending on the R, we have different different types of amino acids with different characteristics, um, and and the carboxyl group and the amino group, you know, uh, they can combine with one another, forming the peptide linkage, which is the amide bond. So, so one one amino acid presents the COH, another amino acid presents this NH2, and they form this whole link, a whole chain of amino acids or proteins. Okay, so, so this picture that you see here is basically a COH, NH2, uh, and the R group, and H. Okay, this is the general setup. Now the amine we know is basic, and the carboxyl group is acidic. And so within them themselves, they exchange the uh, H plus ion. So amino groups are often protonated and, and the carboxyl group is, is a carboxylate ion, okay? <clears throat> now, if the R is CS3, it is called alanine. When the R is H, is glycine, okay, and so on. And this is how uh, the ball and stick model of alanine would look like. Now, if you look at the classification of amino acids, depending on the R group, because the rest of the rest of the molecule is same for everybody. So if you look at the R group, uh, the R group, depending on the R group, we can classify the amino acids. Okay. So R group can, can be decorated with different functional groups. So if it is uh, non-polar, okay, if uh, everything in that R group is non-polar, then it is a non-polar amino acids. So the classification is we have non-polar amino acids and the rest are polar. Now within the polar, we have three kinds. It can be neutral, uh, like uh, if it contains an OH, that's a neutral, right? Uh, or, um, or something like SH, uh, that's polar but neutral. But it might contain acidic groups like COH. There's acidic, uh, polar but acidic, okay? Or it can be polar but basic if it has the amino group. So these are the R groups that you see in blocks, okay, in the uh, in this, uh, I, I guess that's orange block, okay. Uh, so uh, the blue part is the constant region, for, uh, which is common to everybody. But the R group varies, and depending on the R group, we are classifying them like hydrophobic. You can see all these are not, uh, you know, non-polar groups, okay, hydrocarbon groups. Uh, no polar groups here. So these are, uh, you know, non-polar amino acids. Uh, now the properties uh, will depend on that polarity of the R group. Um, and then we have the polar amino acids, like if you have the OH, uh, so you can have CH2OH, you can have CH2OH, 
or something like this. And you can see with the OH, it is called serine, threonine, tyrosine. Now, all these are names that you have heard before, okay, or might have come across uh, these names, okay. Uh, and then you have this asparagine glutamine, okay. And these are polar amino acids, polar hydrophilic, but not ionic. Now, the last two here uh, that you see are ionic because they're either acidic or basic if they contain COH group. So aspartic acid, glutamic acid, they contain COH group. So these are acidic amino acids. And, and then you have histidine, which, is, which has a nitrogen, okay, and lysine and arginine. These are basic amino acids. So these are the four classifications. In four classes, we can divide the amino acids. And when they form the protein, uh, the properties of the protein will depend on which kind of amino acids are present in that protein in more quantities, okay? So it can be DNA binding protein. DNA binding proteins, uh, DNA is negatively charged, okay? Because it's a phosphate group. So a positively charged uh, protein uh, will bind to the DNA. That means it will be rich in arginine and uh, uh, lysine. Okay, when you so uh, that's another field of uh, field in biochemistry, which is basically called bioinformatics, okay, or proteomics. So where you basically uh, you know uh, get unknown protein and try to predict uh, their properties and structure theoretically on computer, okay. Uh, so it's more like computer program, looking at the structure, looking at the general, uh, you know, uh, uh, general composition uh, uh, of the amino acids present in that and try to predict the function. So structure function predictions. <clears throat> so amino acids to do isomers. Now from here, uh, I'm not going to ask you particularly uh, you know, that write the structure of serine or write, write the structure of arginine. But uh, uh, this general classification that there's a hydrophobic group and there's a polar group, that you have to know. And if I give you a structure, so I'll give you a structure of amino acid and I'll ask you, tell me if this is a polar amino acid or tell me this is a non-polar amino acid, that you should be able to level looking at the structure, okay? So the general concept, not, not anything uh, memorization, but like if I look at the structure, I can see uh, the OH. So this is a polar uh, amino acid. So even though if I, if I don't know what the name of that uh, amino acid is, but looking at the structure, I should be able to tell uh, what kind of amino acid it is. So amino acids, as I said, this carbon is chiral, and uh, because the four bonds attached to it, Okay, uh, and so, uh, you know, it has this D and L form, just like we have for the carbohydrates. Now, the way to look at it is similar. Uh, and you can see uh, this, uh, if you look at glycerol dehyde, so uh, we, when we uh, did the DL um, with the carbohydrates, we took glycerol, glycerol dehyde as a reference. Here too, if you take glycerol dehyde as a reference, that the more oxidizing group, which is the CHO, is at the top. And then if you look at the, uh, you know, um, the chiral carbon, the OH to the left is the L, and the OH to the right is a D. Same for the uh, amino acids. So the NH2 group is on the left, we say L, and the NH2 group on the right, we say D. Now, in nature, it's very important. So nature utilizes L amino acids and not D amino acids. Now the D amino acids occur at special places, sometimes uh, in the cell wall of bacteria. And they are target for antibiotics like penicillin, okay? Because we can use penicillin because D, D amino acids do not occur at any other places. So this is cysteine and the only amino acid with the SH group. And this amino acid cysteine is very important because we learned from previous chapter in the alcohol chapter and alcohol and thiols that SH group, when you oxidize, they form the SS, the disulfide linkage. Okay. And so there are cross links within the protein. 
and these are formed by the cysteine amino acid okay so amino acids as acids and bases now amino acid because it has this uh, carboxyl group and the and the nh2 group at the same time uh, so depending on the ph of the solution you can protonate the coh now right now if if it is like a neutral molecule you can see there's a plus and minus the overall molecule is uh, neutral or or zero charge okay so let's say if you if, you, if there's a some kind of tlc okay thin layer chromatography or you put them under uh, you know electric field okay it will not move because it's a, it's a it has a general charge of zero but uh, you know if you if you play with the ph if you change the ph that means if you make it more acidic then the coh will become protonated okay that means the negative charge will start to decrease and the overall amino acid will become positively charged okay and the opposite happens if you make the solution basic okay uh, the nh3 plus will lose the proton and the overall uh, molecule will become negative so in case of amino acids because and this is called a zwitter ion by the way okay uh, this this form of structure you know, where the you know both the plus and minus are existing in the same molecule uh, and uh, and they are basically related by transfer of proton so so this ph at which the amino acid is exactly neutral is called the isoelectric ph pi so net charge is zero and that is a characteristic of the amino acid and depending on the r group and that varies so you can so a basic amino acid or acidic amino acid we can identify looking at the pi okay so the if the ph of the solution is less than pi then the co minus group becomes protonated and becomes coh and the overall amino acid like here becomes positively charged or otherwise if it is basic it becomes negatively charged and if you look at alanine uh, 6 is the pi ps6 okay so below 6 it is positively charged that means if i am applying a voltage it will move towards the negative electrode okay uh, but if i make it basic then it becomes negative and it will move towards the positive electrode so there's a change of movement in the amino acid <clears throat> so pi is important characteristic uh, in uh, for amino acids and uh, and we explain this table here now the now coming to protein so this is the general characteristic of amino acids now <coughs> pro, sorry the proteins they are formed by the reaction of the amino group with the carboxyl group forming a amide linkage and this is called the peptide bond so peptide bond is nothing but amide linkage okay so if the two amino acids we call it a, so they you know for uh, amino acids you know uh, these chains can be very long uh, but for smaller ones like uh, we call it dipeptide tripeptide tetrapeptide pentapeptide but uh, more than five is a polypeptide uh, and uh, usually you know uh, up to uh, 30 40 amino acids we still call them a peptide okay beyond 50 then they start to take some particular structures and then we call them proteins okay uh, so uh, now this is just an example with glycine and alanine uh, you know uh, now you can see that here glycine is presenting the coh group and the alanine is presenting the amino group uh, okay and they are forming a peptide bond so and this is catalyzed uh, by enzyme now in the case of uh, uh, well you know that enzyme that's the ribosome okay ribosome is the center where this peptide bond is synthesized and that's uh, you know uh, that's a huge uh, uh, the, it itself is a, a huge protein missionary made up of proteins okay and rna uh, and it has two lobes which basically sandwiches the dna so it takes information from the rna messenger rna and converts that into protein 
okay but again so this has to be catalyzed okay uh, so this is catalyzed by the enzyme ribosome uh, and you're forming the peptide bond now uh, here you can see the amino terminal uh, has the glycine part and then uh, this carboxyl terminal has the alanine part so there's a direction in which the peptide bond goes okay it can be the opposite if i put the alanine on the left and glycine on the right that is a different peptide okay so a peptide bond has a direction in which it is going and when you read the peptide bond you go from uh, the amino pre amino terminus towards the c terminus so uh, like um, insulin sequence if, if you ask for the insulin sequence and you get you see it uh, uh, it is always given from the amino terminal towards the carboxyl terminal. So there's always two terminals in a peptide bond. Uh, the, uh, the end that has a pre amino group, we call end terminal. Okay. And uh, the one that has the carboxyl group, we say C terminal. Okay. Now, and this peptide bond, you know, there's resonance there. Uh, like the lone pair of nitrogen can delocalize with the with the carbonyl group, and it has a planar structure. And this is the basis for uh, you know uh, protein structure analysis. So, given a sequence, you will see the there are programs that can generate how the protein would look like, how the whole structure would look like, and they basically look at uh, how these planes of the peptide bonds are aligned okay now naming the name so this kind of peptides we can name them now uh, there are so these amino acids they have this uh, you know one letter code and three letter code okay because you don't want to write the name if that you know 100 amino acids uh, even three letter code is is kind of overwhelming but for peptides uh, we can still use the three letter code uh, but if it is a big protein we have to switch to one letter code okay and you can see this code here on the side in the parenthesis okay so uh, when you when you have this uh, you know this peptide between uh, alanine glycine and alanine uh, if you write it in a th three letter code is gly in hyphen ala in two in one letter code is ga again i would not ask you to memorize this but uh, you you know if you work on protein um, you know later you will see that um, uh, you will memorize them anyway okay uh, because that that makes it easier for you to analyze data and things like that rather than switching back uh, to reference that all the time okay so, uh, and, and the IUPAC way of naming it is glycyl. So, always end with an IL. The first, the, the previous amino acids are given an IL name, just like an alkyl, you know, methyl, ethyl, propyl. We say glycyl alanine. Okay. Uh, if there are three amino acids like this, and you can see the end terminus, so we are naming it from the end terminus towards the C terminus. Okay. So you can write it as Ella Gly uh, Sar, Sar is serine, or AGS. Okay. Uh, and if you name it fully, like the IPEC nomenclatures, Alanyl glycyl serine. Okay. And it is always starting from the N terminus and moving towards the C terminus. So if you if you look at this, uh, this is threonine, leucine, and phenylalanine. So threonyl, okay, leucyl, and then phenylalanine. Uh, and and a three-letter code is uh, THR, LU, uh, uh, PHE, or TLF. Now you can imagine that if it is, uh, you know, we can write the three-letter code for four, five, six, seven, eight, uh, but more than that, uh, the one-letter code is more convenient. Okay, now, so this is about, so from the peptide, this is the question I'm going to ask. Okay, uh, I'll give you 
picture of this amino acids and ask you polar or non-polar. Okay, identify them as polar or non-polar. I'll ask you about the stereoisomerism. So if I give a picture like this of an amino acid, you should be able to tell whether this is a D or an L. And if I give you a peptide, and I'll ask you about the PI, definitely there'll be one or two questions about the PI. What is PI? And uh, if, uh, and looking at the PI, can you tell this is acidic amino acid or basic amino acid? Uh, and, and this naming. So if I give you a peptide, so I, I won't ask you to draw the peptide, okay? But I'll, I'll give you the peptide uh, or, uh, and I'll ask you to name it. Like if alanine, uh, alanine, serine, and leucine forms a, forms a tripeptide, what will be the IPEC name? So alanyl, leucyl, serine, okay, that, that's it. Okay, so that's naming peptide will be there. Now coming to proteins. So proteins are basically polypeptides. So more than 50 or more amino acids, and they usually have biological activity. Okay, some are structural. Okay, um, so structural or enzymatic. So, uh, and this uh, this uh, uh, the picture that you see here is that of insulin. Okay, now if you look at this structure, just looking here, we can see that there's a primary structure which is the sequence of the amino acids. Now there are two chains, okay? So things can get complicated. Even insulin is not the most complex of the proteins, okay? But even in insulin, uh, there are two chains, okay? And you can see that two are independent chains and they're held together by disulfide cross bridges. So you have to know, and that, that disulfide cross bridges can be across the two chains or within the, within the chain also. So you have to know the sequence of the A chain and sequence of the B chain, okay? And that is called the primary structure. The primary structure of a protein is the particular sequence of amino acids held together by peptide bonds. The first protein for which primary structure was determined is insulin by Friedrich Sanger in 1953. And insulin has two chains, chain A, which is 21 amino acids, Chain B is 30 amino acids. And the chains are held together by disulfide bond. And these are formed by the thyroid groups dimerizing, okay? So even if you, if you produce insulin and it doesn't form this cross link, it will not function. So there are different levels of complications. So sometimes the DNA cannot produce the RNA. Okay, the RNA cannot produce the protein but even with all that, if the protein is produced, it may not fold properly. So it can be a folding error. And if it folds, then after folding, it doesn't cross link. And that can be this cross link error. So the different, so uh, if you look at a fully functional protein, you know, it has to go through several levels of editing and careful designing before it starts to function. That's why we have malfunctioning protein sometimes if something goes wrong in our body, it, it, and it may not always be related to genes, okay? Uh, maybe the blood pH, uh, your pH of the blood or pH in the cell, uh, you know, has changed, um, which is not letting the protein to function, or it is not forming the disulfide linkages. It is not migrating. So protein, once produced, has to go to its destination, just like your mail. You know, has to reach your home, right? Uh, and and there are address tags, so, and that's called protein translocation. It, it needs to translocate and translocate to the right place. And you can see a huge masonry working there, like postman, you know, holding holding this protein and trafficking it. It's what it's called protein trafficking, trafficking it to the right right destination. Some goes to the mitochondria, some goes to the nucleus. Some, some remains in the cytosol, some, might, some get secreted. So there are signals that somebody has to read it. Okay, read the signal and direct them uh, to that destination. So that's another level of uh, that once produced, the disulfide bonds, everything is fine, but somebody needs to carry it to the right place. Um, so 
So these are you will learn later if you if you do biochemistry uh, and even you know uh, microbiology, cell biology has all these stuffs in more details. Now, so the protein primary structure so the, uh, is the sequence of amino acids, and then we have the secondary structures. So this is like a row, and this can fold. So if you think of a single subunit, so these are called subunits, each chain, and they can fold. And the secondary structure, you know, are held. So this is important, okay? So you'll get a question from there. So the secondary structure, this is these are alpha helix, the coils or the beta plates, they are formed with hydrogen bond uh, arising from the amide. So amide bonds are polar. So when they're forming the peptide bond, there's a uh, CONH2, so NH and CO, so this can form hydrogen bond, okay, NH can form, has a hydrogen, and they form hydrogen bond uh, with the with the amide bond right above it, okay, and that holds the coil, uh, you know, and this is the picture here, and this is how the amide bonds are there, so the question that we'll get, you know, um, which, which kind of bond is responsible for the secondary structure? And the answer is hydrogen bonds within the amide linkages or the peptide backbone. <coughs> so when you draw the protein structure, uh, now we want to make it even more simple because when there, you know, a lot of uh, atoms here, it's like a jungle. You really cannot make out much. So we represent the peptide, the backbone as a ribbon. So ribbon is the chain of the peptide bond that is going along from N terminus towards the C terminus, okay? And, <clears throat> and, and the R groups will be protruding uh, from this ribbon. So, so it's easy to see that way. Now for a helical structure like this, which you call the alpha helix, okay, there's a hydrogen bond uh, between the amide, amide, uh, you know, amide linkages of the peptide backbone. Uh, so the hydrogen bond forms between the oxygen of the carbonyl group and the hydrogen of the NH, okay, with the next turn, okay, so always with the next turn. And there are 3.5 or something like that amino acids between the turns. Uh, so the formation of many hydrogen bond, the formation of many hydrogen bond along the peptide chain gives the characteristic of helical shape, a spiral staircase. And all the R groups of different amino acids extends to the outside of the R group. So the R group basically protrudes out, okay, from this uh, from this ribbon. And so this is this is called the alpha helix. Other kind of structure that you can have is the beta plate. So beta plate is like if you take a cloth and you know uh, if you want to lay it, lay it out uh, on the on the floor with folds, it forms pleats, right? And this is called the beta plate, like this folded paper, okay, is the pleated. <clears throat> and, and that is the structure it has. And in the beta plate, what happens is, this is the peptide chain, and the cross link is happening across, across, so that means uh, one chain, uh, hydrogen bonding with another chain, uh, uh, with adjacent chain. So these two chains can be uh, uh, usually on the same uh, same you know <clears throat> subunit. So the hydrogen bond forms between the oxygen, uh, between the oxygen atom in CO uh, of one section of the polypeptide chain and hydrogen bond of NH of another section. Okay. So it's across, um, and and the beta plate can form between adjacent polypeptide chains or within the same polypeptide. So sometimes it can form with another another chain, separate chain. So beta pleated seeds contain mostly amino acids with small R group. So nature chooses the structure to fit this R group properly. So if the R groups are too bulky, then helix is is more proper because it can put the R groups on the outside. So if the R groups have to kept inside for whatever reason, 
uh, then the best way to form the structure of the beta plate. So the, the, and so smaller groups you know, tend to form beta seeds. So apart from these uh, two main structures, okay, we also have other structures called the triple helix. Now the poly, now triple helix, you can see that is like three row, okay. You are just winding it, okay, uh, like a braid. Um, so this is this, this gives strength. So wherever strength is required, you know, triple helix appears. So collagen is one of them. So uh, polypeptides woven together like a braid. Example collagen. So contains high content. Uh, so collagen, you know, we see in the skin. Uh, so where, where it needs a lot of strength, okay, uh, and and also not not only strength, it has to be it has to have this elasticity, okay. So this contains high content of glycine, proline, alanine, and these you can identify as very hydrophobic amino acids. And apart from that. There's hydroxypolin and hydroxy, that means this can create additional hydrogen bond. So not only is it utilizing the hydrophobic nature, but also uh, the strong hydrogen bonding. So hydroxypolin, hydroxy, these, these are modified amino acids. Okay, not appear everywhere. Okay, but in special uh, you know, proteins like collagen. So the OH group of the modified amino acid provide additional hydrogen bonds making giving it the strength that the collagen needs okay and again uh, if you see that somebody have a disease where they cannot produce uh, this hydroxyproline or hydroxylysine that means hydroxylation is not ha happening then the collagen will be compromised so the skin will be very vulnerable easily crack or things like that okay so if you put them together, so this is the alpha helix. This is the beta plate, how they look like. And the beta plate has a directions, okay? It, 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 it basically goes in opposite direction most of the time, okay? Because, because of the nature. Uh, and, uh, and then all these structures can appear uh, in a protein like this. And you can see this protein is held together very delicately like a rope, if you want to give a rope a structure, it's very difficult. You have to be very careful, very delicate, and proteins are delicate, okay? <clears throat> and that's why when you are dealing with proteins, uh, you have to keep it in cold, keep it in ice all the time, do not shake it too much. Even by shaking, you can, you can denature the protein, you can destroy the protein, okay? Um, you do not want to take it in and out of the refrigerator too many times, okay? You want to. Uh, you do not want to. You want to handle it in a sterile condition. Now, sterile condition is not necessary. Uh, uh, you know, it needs not just not to keep it sterile, but more so that you do not transfer anything uh, that is going to interfere with the protein structure. Like, uh, uh, you know, if, if if there is some contaminations there. Uh, it will uh, ruin the protein structure. They are going to even chop it out. So proteases, you know, cut the proteins into pieces. Uh, if there's a, you have to use distilled water, you know, uh, no regular water because regular water contains ions, metal ions that can destroy the protein. So you have to be very, very careful with protein. So this is very unlike DNA. DNA is just one kind. Okay, DNA is just one kind, plant DNA, human DNA, uh, you know, all same structure. The sequences are different, but the basic chemistry and the stability all remain the same. So you handle the same way. And you can you can freeze dry um, the DNA, and that's why you can do DNA fingerprinting because it doesn't get destroyed that easily. Okay, but protein does. And proteins are the one that are actually doing all the functions within the body. Okay. All the catalysis, all the reactions are done by proteins, which you call enzymes. Okay. Now, okay, so we, we saw the primary structure, which is the sequence of amino acid. We saw the secondary structures, which is the helix and the beta plate, and now the tertiary structures. Now, after forming all these, 
this whole thing protein can fold together okay so they, uh, they fold together like this giving it a particular shape okay so this involves now this tertiary structure involves interaction between the r groups not the amide linkage anymore the amide linkage is involved in the second base structure so the R groups, they, they are polar, they are non-polar, we saw they can be acidic, they can be basic, and they interact among themselves now through hydrogen bond, uh, through hydrophobic interactions, hydrophobic, so these are the different kind of interactions, salt bridge, disulfide linkages, and, and you can see uh, you know, the different kind of interactions that can appear in protein, and it is these interactions, okay, that is holding the protein structure. Okay, giving it the particular shape and and the shape of the protein gives it the function so the way insulin works is because of the shape of the insulin okay if the shape changes insulin will not work okay because the shape is recognized by other proteins <coughs> okay sorry so these are the different kind of interactions that we'll see and and if we uh, and if you remember our uh, intermolecular forces they represent this weak weak uh, intermolecular forces and weak is good because then it can be manipulated so nature manipulates these interactions uh, you know switching on switching on or switching off a particular protein or let's say protein that works uh, uh, in the saliva like uh, amylase will not work in the stomach and something that works in the stomach will not work uh, in the intestine. We, and so there's a compartment. So there's, so <clears throat> nature, nature is basically uh, utilizing uh, these weaker interactions uh, to make a protein functional or non-functional as needed. Okay, now apart from that, a protein goes through numerous modifications like gly glycosylations. So this can be decorated, especially with mammalian proteins. This can be decorated with carbohydrates. Okay, a lot of carbohydrates. And we saw carbohydrates can be really complicated stuff. Okay, so, uh, and these are signals. These act like a signal. The cell type, so the, the, these carbohydrates, uh, when they appear on the, on the peripheral proteins, can act as, um, as an identifier for the cell type. Okay, or as antennas and so on. Okay, so proteins are the main players uh, in the cell. So this is our tertiary structure, you know, the folding of the protein. Now, this is one, one subunit. So this is just one subunit. Now, several subunits, and which is often the case, several subunits can come together, okay, uh, to form what you call the quaternary structure like this. And this is hemoglobin, okay. So here, several, several uh, you know, such, uh, tertiary structure come together to form this enzyme hemoglobin, which can bind the oxygen in the hemoglobin. group. Okay. Now, if you look at the protein shape, okay, the proteins can be globular or fibrous. So globular proteins, they are more or less spherical. And usually this kind of proteins are functional proteins, act as enzymes. And so they're, they're involved in synthesis, transport, metabolism, so on. So whatever functions are carried on. And one example is myoglobin, hemoglobin, you can think of many. Um, okay, so myoglobin, if you look at myoglobin, the picture is here, this is a single subunit, okay. It's a globular protein, almost spherical. And it is basically the protein that binds oxygen in the muscle, okay. It contains 153 amino acids, in a single peptide chain. And three fourths of the chain is alpha helix, so mostly alpha helix. Okay. And it folds to form a globular shape. And within the structure, within this protein, then there are other groups attached to it. And in this case, <coughs> you have the hem group. Uh, the hem group is basically a porphyrin structure with the iron in the middle. And it is this iron that binds oxygen, okay? Uh, and we'll see the same with hemoglobin. Okay, so when there's iron deficiency, 
then the hemoglobin lacks iron uh, and and then it cannot bind oxygen properly so myoglobin uh, is similar to hemoglobin but uh, it uh, it happens to reside in the cell and hemoglobin is the one that carries oxygen uh, towards the cell and then hands the oxygen hands over the oxygen to myoglobin and there uh, is the equilibrium or who has the more binding capacity plays a role okay so myoglobin has a, a greater binding capacity and so it can snatch the oxygen from uh, hemoglobin uh, okay to the iron 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 of the uh, myoglobin and that is why the oxygen get exchanged and it is strictly equilibrium thing okay uh, and and depends on the ph depends on the salt concentration so very 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 delicate stuff there if the ph shift uh, you know then the exchange doesn't happen properly and even though your hemoglobin is carrying oxygen it cannot transfer it to the cell okay uh, so uh, when somebody is having oxygen deficiency it's not always that giving oxygen is going to help okay there may be other things that need to be treated to make myoglobin and hemoglobin exchange better okay so now these are globular proteins uh, now uh, then there are fibrous proteins which are like fibers and we saw the beta carotene with the triple helix okay so these are long thin fiber like shape okay uh, and and involve the structure of cells and tissues two types alpha and beta uh, keratins so the alpha keratins they make up hair wool skin nails okay where you need strength strength and uh, hardness uh, and there's a lot of disulfide linkages uh, and same uh, with the beta keratins uh, you know, beta keratins they are, they have large amount of beta pleats Okay, so these are triple helix and this is beta pleats and these appear in the feathers of bird, scales of, you know, and scales. So uh, one contains alpha helices, triple helices basically, uh, and, and this, is, this is the one where we have the beta pleats. Okay, uh, now the fibrous proteins then give strength and the, uh, in general, the globular proteins are involved in catalysis or they behave as enzymes. So enzymes are the proteins uh, that act as catalysts for a reaction. So they are the main players that, that are involved in reactions. <clears throat> now, if you look at hemoglobin, so this is a quaternary structure of hemoglobin. Uh, so when a biologically active protein consists of two or more polypeptide chain of sub subunits, this is called the quaternary structure. So this is a quaternary structure. Okay, so once everything folded, you got the tertiary structure. Now it has to come together, you know. And uh, many giant machineries, you know, like the DNA polymerase, which does the DNA replication, or the RNA polymerase, which does the RNA transcription, or many, you know, ribosomes. These are these are like quaternary structure of many many proteins. The ribosome has, I think, twenty three separate polypeptides. Okay. Uh, forming the whole ribosome. And they are, you can imagine, they are, they are doing crosstalks among each other, they're changing shapes. Uh, among, so uh, there is basically signaling all over uh, every, every peptide there doing their functions, whatever that is. So these are like giant machines. Uh, so uh, hemoglobin, you know, is similar to myoglobin uh, in structure, but uh, myoglobin is. Uh, is a single polypeptide chain, but hemoglobin is a uh, four polypeptides coming together. So hemoglobin is the, so in the quaternary structure, is the same interactions uh, that you see in the tertiary structures, the weaker forces, okay, that are in play. Um, so similar kind of, uh, so this list that you see here is the same that appear in the quaternary structure. So globular proteins uh, that transport oxygen to the blood. So that is that is hemoglobin. Okay. Now this consists of four polypeptide chains: two alpha and two beta. So alpha chain is 141 amino acid, beta chain is 146 amino acid. Now 
strangely, if you look at the sequences of these two uh, alpha and beta chains, they are quite different, but structurally same. So if you look at the structures here of the orange and the rain, and you compare them, they're almost same similar. So that's, uh, uh, you know, so although they have different sequence, they both form similar structure structure. And each subunit contains a hem group. Now, this is the hem group, the green thing that you see here. This is, a, this is like a flat, the flat ring structure, huge flat ring structure. And at the center uh, is the iron. The red thing is the iron, okay? There's an iron here, which binds oxygen, Fe2 plus, okay? And it is sitting in that place, okay, held together, held by the protein. So this flat ring, you know, with the iron uh, in a, at the center is, is being held by the proteins. And that is all hemoglobin is doing. And, and this giant structure is there to do that function. Okay, uh, that small thing. Um, and that, that is where uh, oxygen is binding. And in an adult, all four subunits must be combined to properly function as oxygen carrier. Again, they're cross -talks. You can see if all, all four of them are not there, hemoglobin is not going to function. So as a single subunit, it does not. And there are a lot of regulations. There is a pH, salt, uh, you know, uh, level of oxygen, level of carbon dioxide, all regulates. So that's why hemoglobin, uh, you know, depending on the pH and the, and the amount of carbon dioxide and oxygen, it, it takes oxygen, uh, in the lungs and releases carbon dioxide. So there's a uh, lot of control there, okay, where it does what. So when uh, it reaches the lungs, that is where it is going to release the carbon dioxide and bind oxygen. So there has to be uh, some kind of connection with the environment in lungs and what it binds. Okay, now these are very delicate stuff um, and held together by all these weaker interactions. So if there's change in any of these amino acids, so usually, if there's a change, uh, you may not see any difference, like a genetic uh, defect. So, all, so we are all, our genes, our DNA are, uh, you know, exposed to a lot of chemicals, a lot of, you know, damaging agents all the time. And our cells are repairing it. So there's, a, you know, elaborate DNA repair machinery uh, in the cell, which is editing our DNA and repairing it all the time. And sometimes it fails to do that. Now, nature, you know, allows redundancy. So, in, uh, so uh, each of these amino acids are, uh, you know, coded by what, what you call the genetic code, so three-letter code. And and there might be you know, three or four such three-letter code representing a particular amino acid. So even if there are changes a little bit here and there, uh, the amino acid might not change. So that's one level of protection we have. So even if our DNA change, the amino acid might not change. That's a good thing. Now, the other, other thing is, uh, the amino acid might change, but it may not affect the structure. As you saw, the alpha and beta almost have the same structure. So, so there are some amino acids that are key and some are not. Okay, so if the key amino acid doesn't change, we are safe. Our proteins are still going to function with a lot of damages you know, happening in our body. Uh, but there are some uh, amino acids which are key, like uh, which have a strong functional group. Like if you look at uh, glutamate, glutamate has a carboxyl group, which is a strong ionic group and, and probably involved in a salt bridge, okay, with ionic bridge with another amino acid. So if you change the glutamate and there's no more polar, you know, such ionic group, then the hydrogen bond or the salt bridge is broken completely and the protein structure falls off. So that is exactly happens in sickle cell anemia. Okay, uh, so the glutamate gets changed to valine. And glutamate is highly polar amino acid, getting changed to highly non-polar amino acid, highly hydrophobic amino acid, valine. And so the pro protein becomes sticky. Okay, so when there's hydrophobic thing, they tend to st stick together, uh, you know, in place of water and the protein becomes sticky. And when it becomes sticky, it aggregates and precipitates in the cell, giving the cell this kind of sickle, sickle shape. 
So because the hemoglobin is precipitating out, it cannot bind oxygen anymore. And you can see it's white is rather than red is. Okay. Uh, and it takes the shape of a sickle and it's called sickle cell anemia. And it's a genetic disease. Okay. And uh, thalassemia, you know, is kind of, uh, it's also uh, a genetic disease, but it's more to do with uh, protein folding. So everything is fine. It doesn't fold properly. Okay, uh, so there can, there, there can be different levels of complications. And the proteins are really, really delicate stuff. Okay. So now, so these are the four structural levels, primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. Uh, and the peptide bonds, you know, the joining is the primary sequence, then the coil, which is happening due to the hydrogen bond, uh, with the amide backbone is basically the secondary structures. We can have the alpha helix, beta plates. Tertiary structure involves the R group, the the uh, you know the side groups that we have, uh, and, and the interactions among the R. So these are weaker interactions. Okay, and same for the quaternary. So in the case of quaternary, you have the same interactions, but now among the subunits. So several subunits are coming together, and they are trying to hold it in hold together in place through these weaker interactions. And again, you can imagine, you know, uh, these subunits are you know, produced separately and someone has to tell you come together and join. So again, that is another um, mind boggling. So it's really, even though we work on this stuff, we just, we just try to find out, you know, what is happening, but if we really go in and see how this is happening, we are nowhere near that. Uh, it's, 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 these, are the, these are big questions, and I don't know, probably remain un unanswered for another 100 years. So, denaturation of protein. Now, this is protein coming together, uh, you know, forming these nice structures here, but uh, they can easily, anything that, anything that uh, interferes with these uh, interactions, can denature the protein. That means it becomes non-functional. Okay, so denaturation can happen. Uh, these are some of the you know causes. Uh, uh, one is temperature. So if the if you increase the temperature, the molecule any molecules vibrate faster, and the vibration is going to kill the protein because it's going to take up these hydrogen bonds and whatever weak interactions there is. Uh, so never heat a protein. So always try to keep it in cold. Uh, Change of pH, so all these are sensitive to pH, okay, all these interactions. So you have to keep an exact pH. So use a buffer is very important in, in protein, especially for proteins and enzymes, because you want to have a strict uh, buffer, buffer pH that is not going to change. Like if it is 8.3, it has to remain at 8.3, it can't be 8.2, okay. Uh, and, uh, Organic solvents are sometimes detrimental because they interfere with the hydrophobic interactions. High salt, if we add a high salt that precipitates a protein, that's called salting out. Okay, uh, so you cannot use high salt, but it needs salt. If you do not add salt, that is also bad. So maybe, uh, you know, the best condition uh, to keep is 50 millimolar sodium chloride. Then you have to keep it at 50. At 100 millimolar, the protein is not, uh, protein will, degrade quickly. No salt, it can precipitate. So there's a very small window uh, over which the proteins work. Okay. And our cell maintains that and controls that to make it functional or non-functional. Okay. Uh, and heavy metals, we do not want heavy metals around because they permanently damage all these carboxylate groups. Uh, if they bind the lead or mercury, you know, it's going to stick the ever, ever, ever since, right? Uh, and you cannot get a, make the, because the binding constant is so high. So you do not want heavy metals at all, okay? So you might want to add some gelating agents that uh, that uh, basically forms complexes with heavy metals like EDTA, okay? In very small amount, uh, just to move, move away the heavy metals from the solution, okay? So these are all about protein structure, okay, so any question up to this point. Now, enzymes, enzymes are proteins, but these are functional proteins, these are biological catalysts. These are the ones that catalyzes reactions, 
Okay. And enzymes, so just like any catalysis, uh, they lower the activation energy. And if I ask you this question, what is the role of enzyme? And you'll probably get this question. They lower the activation energy. Okay, so that the reaction can now uh, happen uh, much easily at a lower temperature. So this is just the energy diagram here. So this is the role of the enzyme. Now, the enzymes, uh, so there are a lot of enzymes in our body. So names and classifications. Uh, so if you, if you see the name, you should be able to, you know, somehow relate to its function, okay? Uh, the kind of uh, work it does. So, so names, uh, you know, usually the names are derived by placing the name of the reaction or the reacting compound with the suffix is. So that's the convention that we had. Like if it is being oxidation reductions, we say oxidases, okay? Dehydrogenases, uh, as the name suggests, the dehydrogenase is basically, uh, well, it's taking up a hydrogen, right? So it's, it's basically uh, dehydrogenating. Sucrase is hydrolyzed sucrose, or lipase hydrolyzes lipid. Now, uh, or, or proteases, the hydrolyzed protein, DNAs, RNAs. So AS means it is basically hydrolyzing something whenever there's the AS, okay. Uh, so some early known enzymes, earlier ones, uh, they had a suffix of it. So we, we still kept it like that. Papain, uh, okay, pepsin, trypsin, chymotrypsin. So these are some. So there, there's also that style of naming. Now the classification of enzymes. More recently, systematic ways. So these are, you know, just a general way of saying is and the in. So more systematic in a, 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 a with a numbering system. Okay, so we not we won't go into that numbering system or coding, but just in general, you know, the systematic method of classifying and naming enzymes. Uh, the name and class of each indicates the type of reaction which catalyzes. So there are six main types. You have the oxidoreductase. So within the oxidoreductase, you can see the so the, the general class that performs oxidation reduction. Oxidases, the oxidizes substance reductions, reductases, they reduce the substance. Okay. And dehydrogenases are belong to the oxidoreductase. And the dehydrogenases they remove hydrogen. 2H, you know, from a double bond. Okay. Then the transferases, and as the name suggests, the transfer group between two compounds. Uh, so transaminases, uh, kinases. So kinases are the transfer, and these are, these are one of the key enzymes involved in activating activation pathways. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so the kinases, so they attach a phosphate group. Uh, transfer a phosphate group from ATP into that protein. And as I said, these proteins needs to be modified further. And one of that key modification is phosphorylation. Okay, uh, phosphorylation, dephosphorylation. Um, and these are done by the kinases and phosphatases. They act in opposing direction. Phosphatases, they hydrolyze the phosphate bond. Okay, uh, now, and then the other class is hydrolase. That means they do hydrolysis. And within that group, you have the proteases, lipases, carbohydrates, uh, sucrase is the hydrolase, okay? Phosphatase, nuclease. So nuclease, the hydrolyze uh, nucleic acid. That means, uh, you know, DNA is a nucleus, okay? Uh, or the RNA is, is a nucleus. And then there's a lyase. And the lyase add or remove group involving a double bond without hydrolysis. Okay, like the car carboxylase, okay. Uh, so decarboxylation, so these are lyases, okay. Deaminases, so that happens a lot in the DNA, deaminating the nucleotides, okay. Isomerases, so we know what isomers are from the carbohydrates, like the glucose and galactose, these are isomers, okay. Uh, so isomerases, they rearrange uh, atoms, okay, within the group. So if you, if you are taking galactose and, you, uh, and the body needs glucose, okay, 
body cannot use the eupolar galactose, so it has to use the isomerase to change the galactose to glucose. Uh, that means it is it is basically working at the uh, stereo, stereo uh, you know that's uh, that chiral carbon atom uh, you know flipping the OH, and that these are done by the isomerases. So isomerases convert the cis trans isomers. Okay, so that's happened like a cis retinol and trans retinol, which is involved in vision. So the way the reason we see is because the switching from the cis to trans. Okay, our vision our sense of light. Epimerases, they convert the D2L, like, well, that's not correct. Um, Epimerases uh, uh, do not convert D2L. It's, it's more like, yeah, D2L on, on a particular, uh, on one, if the several carbon centers are only on one carbon center and leave the others, do not touch the others. Um, so uh, one of the key epimerases is UDP glucose for epimerase, which converts, which is in the, uh, you know, galloperon, the galactose utilizing pathway, uh, and and any defect in that pathway in that conversion, you know, uh, results in galactosemia. Okay, uh, and then there's the ligases, which is the sixth one. Ligase means join. And one of the key enzyme ligating enzyme is the DNA ligase. So today molecular cloning, we can do molecular cloning and all these genetic modification and funny and dangerous stuffs. Okay. Uh, we can do like changing the genes and things like that can happen due to the ligase because we cut and paste. You take a section of the DNA from somewhere else, put it in another place and join them. And the key enzyme for that is the ligase. Okay. So these are the different classes of enzymes. So you have to know these classes broadly. Okay. And some of these names, and these are very common names. So if you uh, you know, uh, uh, if, if you open a microbiology book, you know, half of that is chemistry and cell biology. So if you know these enzymes, it'll be easy for you to follow, follow those you know, biology stuff. Okay, so character, now enzymes, we saw enzymes are basically catalyst and, and, and this is the energy profile. Uh, and how do they function like that? So, uh, and, and that's because of the structure, the shape. So the characteristic of the enzymes is this, that nearly all enzymes are globular. Each has a unique three-dimensional shape that recognizes and binds small group of reactive molecules called substrate. It is that shape, that folding, that, that creates a niche, some kind of groove in, in the protein where certain molecules can bind. So it's a complementary to the shape, and not only shape, the surface charge. And together it gives, it makes it highly specific for that, uh, for that substance, like hexokinase, is specific to glucose. And if you see it's a giant enzyme, but this is only small region where the glucose binds. So all these giant structures to create that, and not only create, create and uh, you know, protect. Okay, that shape, hold to the shape, okay, which is basically, uh, which basically takes in the glucose and and phosphorylates it, add a phosphate group. So it has to hold the glucose, it has to hold the ATP and then transfer the phosphate group. And it is basically, it can do that due to the shape and the charge distribution on that surface. So each has a unique 3D shape that recognizes and binds small groups of reacting molecules called substrate. The tertiary structure of the enzyme played an important role. Okay, that means the shape, the folding, and all these things. Okay, and the enzyme must bind to the substrate. Okay, uh, in a way that catalyzes the reaction. It has to bring those, you know, substrates together at the right place in the right orientation. Okay, it has to activate the bond. Uh, so there has to be bond activation. Otherwise, the reaction won't happen. So you have to bend or do something to the bond or stretch it so that it becomes weaker. Okay. So within the enzymes, large tertiary structure is a region called the active site. So all this happens in a small region uh, in the in the in the protein, which you call the active site. So the active site is where the substrate of substrates, there can be several, they are held while the reaction takes place. 
and the active side usually closes, closely fits the, the shape of the subset. Now, oftentimes there's induced fit. That means as the subset binds, it closes in and engulfs, okay? So the active side, you know, but, so this is the, basically the place where everything is happening. Um, or at least the reaction is happening. Uh, okay, and, and uh, so the uh, substrate is being held held in that active site to different kind of interactions like hydrogen bonds, solid bridge, hydrophobic interactions, and so on. And so the rest of the protein has also a role. So there might be some small molecule binding at other places in the protein, activating it, changing the shape, giving it the uh, actual active. So uh, so those are signaling molecules, okay? So the, it's not that the rest of the protein is not doing anything. So they, they are involved in sensing uh, other stuff that can be signaling, signaling molecules, increasing its activity or decreasing activity, changing its shape and so on. So there, there are a lot of dynamics going on there. So the active site of a particular enzyme fits the shape of a few type of substrates, which makes an enzyme very, very specific. So that's the reason of specificity, okay. Now, so now the enzyme action, so enzyme, we think the enzyme works uh, because of subset binds. So there are different models of the, you know, this subset binding. One of that is induced feed. Uh, so induced feed uh, is currently what we, what, what we mostly accept where um, you know, the substrate binds, the protein basically, you know, you can see there's change of shape, okay? And uh, it basically fits, fits the shape of the substrate. Uh, this is, in, uh, you know, induced fit kind, okay? Uh, so in this model, there's a lot of flexibility in the active side, allows it to adapt to the shape of the substrate. The shape of the substrate may also be modified uh, to better fit into the active side. The substrate can also undergo bond twisting, like you know, one you can twist the R group or, uh, and make room um, there and and so on. So everybody you know is kind of very dynamic there, uh, trying to fit best as they can, uh, and 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 that also gives some flexibility. So uh, always specificity is not good. Sometimes uh, uh, you know you want the same enzyme. Uh, to work on several substrate. So induced speed kind of, you know, explains how one, one single enzyme, like a protease. The protease job is to, you know, go and chop a protein and it can be any protein. So it's, it should be able to hold any protein, but it has to be a protein. So there's some specificity, uh, but yet some flexibility that uh, uh, anything that we eat should be chopped by carbon trypsin or trypsin in, in the stomach, right? Um, so, so and, and the endospeed basically explains that. Okay, so both the enzyme and substrate work together to acquire a geometrical arrangement that lowers the activist energy. So at the end of the day, the activist energy needs to lower. So that's so that something that uh, would have taken me in the lab, like 100 degrees centigrade, 200 degrees centigrade to achieve, can be achieved by 37 degrees centigrade to your body, body temperature, okay. So that's the beauty of the enzymes. Now this is a, this is exokinase, okay, binding glucose, and you can see uh, there's the induced speed. So the protein has actually changed shape. You know the top part is coming closer to the bottom part, uh, kind of engulfing it more, okay. And there's also it needs the molecule ATP along with it uh, to do the phosphorylation. So the factors affecting the enzyme action. So anything, you know, that denatures the protein will de will remove the activity. Okay, so it has to have a, uh, you cannot it always have optimum pH. Okay, something that works in the stomach will not work in the intestine, as I said. Okay, uh, so the the and, and that also leads to compartmentalizing in our cell, like the compartments are there so that different enzymes can work at different places. Like the lysozymes, you know, if they come out of the lysozyme, is is hazardous, right? Uh, so these are more vesicles inside the cell uh, where, where the lysozymes, the enzymes that uh, basically hydrolyzes carbohydrates, uh, the cell wall of 
bacteria, but, uh, but they need to be destroyed. But if those enzymes come out in the open in the rest of the cell, then they're going to chop off their own cells, own, own proteins. So you want, want them to compartmentalize. And, 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 and that is also controlled by the particular pH at what they work. So even if they come out in the cytosol, they'll immediately become inactive because cytosol has a different pH. So that is nature's way of protecting against itself. Okay. Uh, so the enzymes are most active at optim optimal pH. Again, the buffer is so important here to keep that pH. Okay. And this is the pH uh, at which proper tertiary structure is maintained. Above and below the pH, the interactions are disrupted and the enzyme can no longer work. And if you look at this chart, there's a lot of variability uh, of these enzymes at which uh, at the pH at which they can work. Okay, so you can see the pepsin can work at one point, the acidic pH, stomach, you know, stomach pH basically, uh, sucrase, amylase. So these are, these work at nuclear, almost nuclear pH. Then there are DNA binding proteins that work at uh, largely, uh, uh, you know, uh, or, or the enzyme lipase, arginase. They are working at highly alkaline pH. Okay. So pH is very important uh, for enzyme action. Now, enzyme inhibition, so these are basically uh, how we can inhibit these enzymes. And this can be, uh, uh, you can think of uh, this more like a drug action. When you are designing a drug, stop an enzyme. Uh, so, what, so there are different ways you can do that. And these are called inhibitors. So enzyme inhibitors are molecules that cause the enzyme to lose activity. Okay, and they can lose activity in several ways. Uh, so uh, apart from denaturing it, so that's from substrate, uh, substrate binding. So they prevent the active site to bind with the substrate. So they can compete. So if you make something that binds to the same place as the substrate, so they're going to compete and will not let the substrate bind. Okay, these are, this is called competitive inhibition. So they compete for the same site uh, in the enzyme. non competitive inhibitor, you know, they basically do not resemble the substrate and do not bind to the active site, but they bind to the enzyme in the uh, surface, which is not an active site, that means some other place. So uh, as you can see, this inhibitor I is binding uh, somewhere on the site, so some other place, but that changes the shape of the enzyme. And then the active site should change and it cannot bind the substrate anymore. So this is another kind of, and we call them non-competitive inhibitor. Okay. And <clears throat> uh, so any of these can be used as drug or reducing the activity on an enzyme. Irreversible inhibitors are those that permanently, uh, you know, uh, kills an enzyme and uh, through, usually through uh, covalent modification. So usually forms a covalent bond with an amino acid of the enzyme. So uh, one important drug like penicillin, you know, that is how it works. So yeah, it, penicillin has a beta lactam ring and it can bind to beta lactamase. And when it binds to beta lactamase, it basically makes a covalent linkage with the beta lactamase and uh, basically, uh, you know, uh, killing the enzyme. Okay, so this is the summary. So there, there's a lot there. We just touched the surface. Okay, we just wanted to get an overview, but you can always go deeper into the subject. Okay, very very interesting subject, and not only interesting is the first subject. So um, it can be a full thousand page book, just the protein chemistry itself, or more. Uh, and 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 this is the summary of what what we just studied. Okay. Uh, but important things, you know, ever if you come across proteins, look for its primary structure, secondary structure, tertiary structure, quartary structure. Okay, you should know how to read the protein. And when you see the name, uh, you know, you should be able to uh, closely, if not fully, at least identify what kind of function it can perform, okay, by looking at the name. Okay, so these are kind of helpful things, right? So when you move on to uh, more of biology, uh, it'll be helpful.
the proteins are created from the DNA, if you think of it that way. And there's a lot of control that goes on in the DNA, like the promoter control, like the, you know, uh, all this. So DNA, you know, there's DNA replicates. So that's one level of control there. Okay. Uh, and it has to transcribe. So DNA forms from DNA, we get the RNA. Uh, and, and the RNA forms the protein. So whether I need a protein gets controlled at the level of the RNA. Okay, the cell signals, okay, well, I need a protein. Or something goes and tells, okay, start making the RNA. So there's a lot of controls there you know, happening. And, and, uh, and the RNA, once made, uh, has to come out uh, from the nucleus into the cytosol, okay, uh, to be translated into protein. And, and when it does, the start codon, the stop codon, and the protein is being made, it gets folded, get trafficked into the proper place. Uh, the whole thing is a, a huge chain of events, okay? And finally, uh, things work, and there are, uh, now not, now you can come across uh, other things like microRNAs. Oh, that's where uh, they're splicing of the RNAs. So RNAs are formed, but again, they need to be cut, cut into, not in bacteria, but mammalian cells, they're splicing, okay? This, uh, unwanted region supplies and put together to get the actual reading frame. Uh, so all this goes on all at the same time. And then the proteins are also destined for destruction, ubiquitinism, okay, uh, which we haven't discussed uh, here. But these are uh, and uh, so many things going on there. Okay, uh, so uh, once a protein becomes non-functional, the cell doesn't want, doesn't want it anymore. And it wants, wants it to get you know, uh, get the building block and find a new, and make a new protein out of it, right? So it sends it to proteas of missionaries uh, where it gets chopped off and there's a ubiquitous signaling, okay, that does it. So the, the non-functional protein gets tagged with ubiquitin and that takes it to the proteas of, which is giant, you know, paper shader, okay, something like that. It sends the protein uh, and all this, you know, amino acid that comes out now, gets utilized to make other proteins. It's a recycling missionary inside inside the cell. Uh, and so there are a lot of things here and all of them involve protein. Okay, even, even the control of the DNA, the making of the DNA involves protein. Okay. Uh, all right, so I think that's the end of the chapter. <laughs>